All right, Lord, we love you. We bless you. Uh, yeah, the Bible study has been going actually for, I have been doing it for a year, but uh, we've just locked in on the gospels as for this season. <clears throat> Father, we love you. We thank you and we bless you. God, we're so grateful for marking us yesterday with the humility of Jesus. And I ask you today that you would encounter us with the Holy Spirit. I pray for the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of your son. Open up the scriptures and cause our hearts to burn in the name of Jesus. Amen. Good, good, good. Yes. Yeah, uh, Lisa, they, all they have to do is enroll on Corey Russell online. They don't have to take the classes, but they'll have to enroll. And so you can send them to Corey Russell online for that. They can, they can enroll and then they get access to our email list, which is how we send stuff out to you guys. All right, good. Well, I wanna, I wanna pick up where we left off. Again, I wish we could just hang out in the act of Jesus girding himself, taking off his garments, girding himself with a towel and then washing the disciples' feet and then commanding them saying, what I've done for you, do for each other, serve each other, go to the lowest place. And again, I believe that the core aspect of the nature of God is humility. God is humble. And he is into changing us into humble people. And so, anyway, so I just want to, I just want to, I just was so impacted that by that yesterday. But I think this is interesting is that right after the washing of the disciples' feet, is when Jesus is going to shift into highlighting Judas as the betrayer. All right, so let's, let's just start right here in verse uh, 18. Yeah, 18. He says, so he's done all this, and he says, um, I do not speak concerning all of you. I know whom I've chosen, but the scriptures may be fulfilled. He's going to quote Psalm 41, verse 9. He who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. Now I tell you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe that I am he. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. Okay? When Jesus had said these things, now here it is. Now he's going to lock in, and he was troubled in spirit. So... That must be evident. They could look at his face. He was grieved. He carried it. He, he was visibly shaken and troubled. And he testified and said, most assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. I mean, he's sitting around the table with the 12. He's just washed their feet. He washed Judas's feet. He washed all their feet. And now he gets up from the table. And with a grieved face, he says, one of you is going to betray me. Now, this is amazing. Then the disciples looked at one another, and they were perplexed. And they asked about whom he spoke. Now, this is absolutely amazing. Now, there was leaning on Jesus' bosom, okay? So I want you to picture this right here. You, you, and they didn't have chairs like we have chairs. They're all sitting around, and Jesus is laid back. And John, we're about to see John come into the picture, as he's literally leaning back on Jesus' breast, so close that he has access to be able to talk right into Jesus' ear. They're so intimate. They're so close. It's such an intimate setting. And, and I love this because I want to give you all, here's, a, here's the first thing I want to leave with you guys today. The doorway into the secrets of God is proximity and intimacy. Proximity and intimacy opens the door for divine secrets. I love, we, I love to talk about the prophetic as well as gifting, but I want to give you a, a vision for prophetic based out of intimate intimacy, based out of proximity. Prophetic rooted in, in proximity. Okay. Look at this. Now there was leaning on Jesus's bosom, one of the disciples whom Jesus loved. <laughs> John is going to refer to himself as the one that Jesus loved about three different times. And, and we're going to see it a lot more here towards the end of John. 
I want every one of you to begin to lay hold of this as your identity. I'm the one Jesus loves. I'm the one Jesus enjoys. I'm the one that Jesus deeply loves. When that becomes your identity, that becomes your definition of success. That becomes your definition of uh, greatness. And a power is when you become the one that Jesus loves. It says this, the one whom Jesus loved, he motioned, it says that Simon Peter motioned to him to ask of who it was he spoke, okay? Then leaning back on Jesus's breast, he said to it, here it is, Lord, who is it? Look at this. Jesus is about to tell John who the betrayer is. Jesus answered and said, it's he to whom I shall give a piece of bread. It's the one that I shall give a piece of bread when I have dipped it. And having dipped the bread, get this, he dips the bread and he gives it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Now, after the piece of bread, Satan entered him. John lays this out in absolutely such a vivid way. John lead back. Who is it, Lord? The Lord tells him, the one to whom I dip the bread and give it to, he's the one that's going to betray me. He dips the bread, and as soon as he hands it to Judas, Jesus hands the bread to Judas, and when Judas takes the bread, Satan enters him. Now, I, I don't know if that was a visible manifestation. I don't know how Satan entered him. I don't know if John is looking back 60 years later and say that's when it began or the atmosphere began to shift. I don't know if an atmosphere began to shift, but Satan entered Judas, and that was the end where Satan took over to manifest through Judas's agreement with darkness. Now look, I, I don't know. I don't know. Lisa was asking, do you think Judas heard Jesus say, the one who got to take the bread? I don't think so. I think John was right up close to him, and it was a whisper. And I think Jesus, in essence, was going to say, I'm going to tell you what I'm about to do. All right, so let's look at this. Then Jesus said to him, what you do, do quickly. Because no one at the table knew. That, that lets you know right there that they couldn't hear him. That nobody knew for what, for what reason he said this to him. For some thought that because Judas had the money box, that Jesus said this to him, buy those things for the feast. And having received the piece of bread, he then went out immediately. And here's the phrase, it was night. I mean, the setting is, the setting is set. The stage is set. Judas now there, thereby goes to plot for Jesus' Jesus's betrayal. Later on that night is when they'll come into the garden and that whole night will begin. That's actually a great question, Rebecca. Do you think, I mean, to the Corinthian church, Paul said that if some of you take this in an unworthy manner, some of you are sick and dying among yourself. I think, I think the washing of the feet exposed it, but I think the communion, you know, enforced it. <clears throat> All right, it was night. I, I think it was, it got solemn. It got intense. It got, um, it, the, the, the night, the, the, the evening began to shift and it began to get really solemn. And guys, I just want to say it to you as simple as I can and as we're getting into this here. I, I would say John 14 through 17. And as we're getting towards the end of 13 into 14, these are among the greatest passages in the whole word of God. If someone were to just get saved and I were to lead them to the four chapters in the Bible, it would be 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. I would lead them to these chapters because this is how Jesus prepares weak believers for hours of shaking. Okay? I want to finish up 13, then we're going to get into 14. So when he had gone out, Jesus, look at this, said, now the Son of Man is glorified. And God is glorified in him. And if God is glorified in him, God will glorify him in himself and glorify him immediately. Little children, hold on to that phrase. I shall be with you a little while longer. 
okay? You will seek me. And as I said it to the Jews, where I'm going, you can't come. Do you remember in earlier of John, he told the Jews, I'm going and you can't come. Well, they thought he was going to the Greeks or they thought he was gonna kill himself or something else was gonna happen. Now he's telling his disciples, I'm going somewhere you can't go. He's talking about through death to the throne room. He says, you will seek me. And as I said to the Jews, where I'm going, you cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another. I love that Jesus gave those disciples each other. Jesus gave the disciples to each other. I, I'm grateful for spiritual mothers and fathers, but at the end of the day, Jesus didn't even raise up a transgenerational movement. He gave brothers to each other. And I want to encourage you to begin to find a strength in your brother and in your sister that many times we've overlooked because there's a lot more difficulty. The devil always rages war over the siblings, over the brothers and over the sisters. That's where the war is at. It's easier for us many times to relate to Papa and Mama, but God gave them each other. Jesus gave them each other. He says, love one another. He goes, that, he goes as I've loved you, you love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another, which means you operate in John 13. You are each other's cheerleaders. You fight for each other's causes. You go the extra mile to contend for their breakthrough as much as your own. And you don't see them being given something as something being taken away from you. That when you feel that thing hit you of someone else getting blessed, and then you feel the need that something's been taken from you, that's where that spirit of envy, division, and strife is in you. You want God to eradicate that stuff from your life. So I love it. Simon Peter didn't even hear Jesus talk about the new commandment. All right. He didn't even hear Jesus talk about the new commandment. Look at Simon Peter. Simon Peter said, Lord, where are you going? <laughs> it's just like us. None of us listen to the new commandment. Everybody don't even listen to that loving one another thing. We're like, Jesus, where are you going? <laughs> And, he, and Jesus says, where I'm going, you cannot follow me now. Everybody circle that word now. Amen. Hopefully you have that. I have the new King James. That word now, he says, but you shall follow me afterward. So there's a now and an afterward. You can't follow me now, but you're going to follow me afterward. And we'll see that in John 21 here in a week or two. When we get to where Jesus, after the restoration of Peter, says, follow me. Peter has to go through an earth-shattering revelation that he's not as dedicated as he thought he was, but that Jesus was going to pull him through this dark night, and on the back side of this, he is going to follow Jesus. And Jesus, in essence, is saying, buddy, you're about to get, the, you're about to get everything shifted in your life. So Peter said, Lord... Why can I not follow you now? I love Peter right here, guys. If I had time, I would walk you through. I had one of my most powerful encounters around these verses that, I, that I'm going to be walking through today. Possibly, I spent seven days in Norway in 2001 at a YWAM DTS with a guy by the name of Gary Weens. And long story short, I had walked through a previous season where I'd felt like I had failed the Lord. And for seven days, the Lord walked me through the story beginning in John 13, 36, all the way to 14, 3, to where I call it Jesus. I had 10 hours alone with him every day. And he walked me through a theophostic uh, Holy Spirit session to where he brought me into the Father's house. Anyway, I, I have that in different things. I might find, what I might do is fi find, uh, find it and uh, give you, put it in here or, or send it to you guys in the email list. I'll, I'll get that for you. All right, good. Um, he says, where I'm going, you can't follow me now, but you're going to follow me afterward. I love Peter's heart. He wants to follow Jesus. Okay, why can't I follow you now? 
And then Peter thinks that his ability to stay up with Jesus is to show some unique aspect of his devotion that separates him from everybody else. Get a hold of this. Everybody lock in with me. Peter wants to follow Jesus into the next season. And he thinks that it's about him showing something unique about his dedication that separates him from everybody else. So he's going to pull out the ultimate test and the ultimate statement of dedication. I will lay down my life for you. All these other jokers, they don't love you like I love you. I will lay down. I will go with you to death, Jesus. He had been hearing about death. Jesus had been talking about death. Peter didn't know what he was saying, but he was saying, if you're dying, I'm dying. I'm going with you. And Jesus looks at him and he goes, will you really? Will you lay down your life for my sake? Most assuredly, I say to you, the rooster shall not crow till you have denied me three times. He looks Peter in the face and he goes, Peter, I love you so much, but you are about to fail me more miserably than anybody in history on the most important night of human history. <laughs> Which means this, you're not as dedicated as you think you are. You're not as awesome as you think you are. And guys, I wanna say it to everybody on here. This whole night and this whole point of Jesus' death, Gethsemane, the whole thing was about the exposing that human strength, human ability, human dedication is not enough. It's about faith in Jesus. It's about faith in Jesus and the work of the cross when everybody else falls short, there's one man hanging. That's why this is one of my favorite statements to Jesus. Jesus, you're the man. You're the man. He looks, I, I, I can see, Jesus isn't saying this in a mean way. He's looking at him and he's going, Yeah, we'll get to that. Karen was asking the envious between John and, G, uh, John and Peter. I don't think it was envious. I think it was maybe a little competition. These two were the two pillars. These guys were in the core. So Jesus tells Peter, Peter, you're about to fail me miserably, but look at 14.1, and this is where I want to bring us today. Okay, first 20 minutes of just setting you up so we can get to 14.1. Here is the main, if I'm gonna give you one statement over the upper room discourse and over John 14, 15, 16, and 17, it's the first verse of John 14. Let not your heart be troubled. The whole message, the whole thing, everything that Jesus is going to say from this moment, everything that he's done and everything that he's gonna talk about this night, is about stabilizing the human heart. It's about removing fear off the human heart. It's about breaking the fear of isolation and being alone and being it, because when their whole worlds are exposed and they find they're not as dedicated as they thought they were, Jesus is gonna release a message that's gonna stabilize the human heart. This message is about breaking fear and trauma off the human heart. Jesus is going to assert his divinity right here, his equality with the Father. You believe in God, believe also in me. He says, I want you to know that in the same way you believe in God, I want you to put your faith in me because when you're unable to get there, go ahead and get on my back. I'm going to pull us through. I want you to believe in me. And then Jesus is going to speak to the core fear inside of Peter, as well as all of us. And it's the fear of there being a spot for him. It's the fear of, is there room for me? In my father's house, there are many mansions. And now he's going to address the fear. If it were not so, 
I would have told you. He says that if this was about your unique dedication and about that's how you get into Abba's house, I would have told all of you and I would ask who wants to die the most and go through the most suffering for me. And whoever can jump the highest and do the most, they get in. He said, I want all of you to know that in my father's house, there's many mansions, there's plenty of room. And he says this, and I go, verse three, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also, and where I go, you know, and the way you know. Every phrase of John 14. I don't even know how we're going to get through it today. <laughs> In the ancient world, what Jesus is talking about right here is bridegroom bride language. In the ancient world, you would betroth yourself, the, the man would betroth himself to the wife, give, a, the, give the dowry gift, and then would return back to his father's house and build on to his father's house and then come get the bride and bring her to, her to his father's house. Jesus is using this language right here because this whole night, the, the wine and, and the food, the whole thing that's happening between the Passover meal, between this, it's a betrothal ceremony. It's a betrothal ceremony. That's why on in Exodus 19, and 24, the, the children of Israel sat on the mountain and they ate and they drank in the presence of God. There's always a meal when there's a betrothal ceremony. And that's what Jesus is doing, saying, I'm giving myself to you. And I want you to know, I'm going to come back and I'm going to receive you to myself. You're going to be with me forever. <clears throat> I do. I think it. And so when I think about this in two ways, I think about one, I think about ultimately his second coming, that he is going to come Abba's house. He is going to come and he's going to bring us to Abba's house, not up in the sky because Abba's house is coming to the earth. Abba's house is coming to the earth. All right, that's the new Jerusalem, the descent of the new Jerusalem out of heaven to the earth. He is going to bring us, and so ultimately it's about the second coming, and then he's going to come get us. But I want to tell you that I also believe this is post-resurrection, and what we're going to begin to talk about now is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the indwelling Spirit that's going to bring them into Father's heart. It's Father's house and Father's heart, and what Jesus is saying is, I'm going to bring you in. I'm going to bring you in to where I've been living with the Father I'm going to bring you in so that you can be with me and Abba. So that we can have confidence now. And so Jesus says, where I go, you know, and the way, you know. Thomas said, Lord, we don't know where you're going. <laughs> How are we going to know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus said, buddy, Thomas, I'm the way. I'm the highway. I'm the ladder. I'm God's arm. I'm the outstretched arm of heaven to you, and I'm your outstretched arm to the Father. In me, I make peace between God and man. I am the mediator. I am the intercessor. I am the reconciler. In me, heaven and earth are brought together. God and man are brought together. You come through me. You come in me. And that's how you get to the Father. That's how you get to the Father. I am the way. I'm the highway. I am the truth. And I am the life. I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. Truth is not a set of rules or a list of things. Truth is a person. His name is Jesus. We'll, we'll, we're just going to keep going just because this is unbelievable. Jesus says, if you had known me, you would have known my father. And from now on, you know him and you've seen him. Philip said, 
Lord, show us the Father, and that, that'll be enough for us. Just show it to us. Come on. We're here. Pull it. Come on. Let's sing it. Jesus says, have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? One of the greatest verses in the Bible right here. He who has seen me has seen the Father. This is what my dad acts like. This is what my dad looks like. Me and my father are one. The way I talk is the way he talks. The way I act is the way he acts. I and my father are one. Jesus is the face of God. When you see me, you see the father. <laughs> Every phrase is like meditation. I was trying to get through it this morning, but I just read a phrase and just get lost. He goes, do you not believe that I'm in the Father? He's going to talk about the indwelling Father. We talk a lot about the indwelling Spirit. Do you know that the Father indwelt Jesus? The Father, here's a phrase I want you to pray through. And here's how you pray through the Bible. You say the phrase, Father indwelt Jesus. The Father lived, lives in Jesus. He says, don't you know that I'm in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I'm in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. That's exactly right, Samantha. It's union. The Father and Jesus are one. It's what he told us in John. I and my father are one. He's in me. I'm in him. He's in me. I'm in him. We are one. We think the same. We are, we are mutually submitted to one another. Now, get, get your seatbelt on, everybody. Because it's a, Jesus is about to blow open the heavens. He says, most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will also do, and greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father. Jesus is saying, guys, you ain't seen nothing yet. He says, you think it's been awesome with me here in the flesh with you? I'm about to go to the Father because he's prepping them for talking about the Holy Spirit, and now it's not just Jesus and the Father and Father and Jesus, but he's saying me and you are now in Jesus and in the Father. And now we're gonna be brought into this holy communion and holy union with the Godhead. Woo! That's why he could say greater works than these you will do. That's right, Viola, it's Pentecost. It's the outpouring and the indwelling spirit. Glory. He says greater works than these you will do because I go to my Father and whatever you ask in my name, that I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Even tonight, as I was getting, tonight we have our Teach Us to Pray live session and I'm going through John 14 today and I'm like, man, we got to talk about this tonight. I mean, the power of union with answered prayer. The power, because last week we talked about fellowshipping with the Holy Spirit. And I want to invite you guys, if you guys haven't jumped on, you can still jump in, get the archive sessions, and jump into our live sessions tonight. You want to do that. But I, I, this is so central to authority in prayer is union. He says, and whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. <laughs> if you love me, keep my commandments. Get your seatbelt on, everybody. Here we go. Here we go. And I will pray the Father. Jesus is saying, guys, if you love me, I'm going to go to heaven and I'm going to pray the Father. And he will give you another helper. That he may abide with you forever. Everybody say forever. <laughs> Holy Spirit is not a band-aid till Jesus comes back. 
He is your eternal roommate. He will dwell in you forever, forever. And then Jesus calls him the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. He called them little children earlier in John 13, 36, I think. No, no, John 13, 33. He called them little children. And he says, guess what, guys? This is the core fear of the disciples on that night. We're going to be left alone. We're going to be left alone. We got to deal with the Jews. We got to deal with the Pharisees. We got to deal with the Romans. And then Jesus is leaving. They were clinging to Jesus. They didn't want him to leave. They didn't want him to go. They loved him so deeply. And many of us know the fear of rejection or the fear of isolation or loneliness and being left alone to our own vices. That's really what fear is, is it's you alone and you got to deal in your limited resources, your limited understanding, your limited abilities. And so fear hits you because you can't do it. And Jesus is breaking fear off the human heart by the revelation of the indwelling spirit, by the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. He goes, guys, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I am not going to leave you as orphans. I'm going to bring you into Abba's house by the Holy Spirit. I'm going to come on the inside of you. I'm going to bring you in. I'm going to put you in the house. This is all, we talked about this with the prodigal son. You got younger son outside the house, older son outside the house. Jesus brings sons into the house. I love this. I love this. I love this. He calls him the spirit of truth. I will not leave you orphans. It's just amazing, but let's keep going. A little while longer on the world will see me no more. But you will see me. But you will see me. Because I live, you will live also. At that day, get your seatbelt on, you will know I'm in my Father. Okay, he's already established that but then he's about to drop a bomb on the planet and you in me and I in you. <laughs> he goes, so picture this, Jesus in the father, me in Jesus and Jesus in me. So you are hidden in Christ with God. We are hidden in Christ with God. We are joined with him. We are one with him in the father. Hallelujah. Friend, that, that thought alone is enough to keep you busy for the next hundred years. <laughs> In that day, you will know. And then Jesus says, he who has my commandments and keeps them, it's he who loves me and he, oh, get your seatbelt on, he will be loved by my father. Who wants to be loved by Abba? See, I see this, and he says, and I will love him, and I will manifest myself to him. The manifestation of Christ to the soul. The revelation and the manifestation of Christ to the, to the soul, to where we see his face with the eyes of faith. We see him real, we connect with him, and he imparts his life and his love and his grace and his power to our spirits. That's really good, Emily. It's a revelation of love that brings true obedience. But what I love about both 14, 21 and 23 is it doesn't stop. There's just ongoing revelation and manifestation and encounters and deeper love and deeper union and deeper consciousness of Christ in you, the hope of glory. Judas, look at verse 22. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him. <laughs> and we will come to him 
and make our home with him. Who is the we? Jesus says, all three of us are coming in. All three of us are coming in. The Father, the Son, the Spirit. And we will make our home with him. And he who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. Glory. These things I have spoken to you while being present with you. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, look at what he'll do. Number one, he will teach you all things. He will bring to you remembrance all things that I said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Peace is a person. His name is Holy Spirit. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. See, he's encapsulating the whole thought right here. He's bringing it back to don't let your heart be troubled. Holy Spirit's coming. He's peace. He's going to remind you of everything because all of you, this is the point you all need to know. We're not that smart. We don't got a lot going for us. He goes, he goes I know. It's okay. That's why I'm going to come live on the inside of you. I'm going to help you. Everybody say, I need help. <laughs> I need help. 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 <laughs> I need help. Come on. I need help. That's why he's sending you a helper. Hallelujah. And now he said, peace. He goes, if you loved me, you would rejoice because I said, I'm going to my father. And now I've told you before that when it does come to pass, you may believe I will no longer talk much with you for the ruler of this world is coming and he has nothing in me. The devil has nothing in Jesus. The devil has nothing in Jesus, but that the world may know that I love the father and the father gave me commandment. So I do arise and let us go from here. And so I, I see it right here that they've been in the upper room and now they're going to begin to walk to Gethsemane. I, I see John 15, 16, 17 as, and I see 17 right outside of Gethsemane or in Gethsemane, but, but it's the walk from the upper room to Gethsemane. So he says, arise, let us go from here. So they start walking. And that's when he's going to do the vine and the branches parable, which is what we'll look, uh, look at tomorrow. Now, my goodness, I cannot overemphasize the power of, the, I, I cannot, and again, I've said this to you guys several times, um, I wrote a book called Glory Within, and it's, 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 most people just think, well, he's just talking about tongues. It's not, it's about tongues, but the bigger point is not tongues, it's about connecting with the indwelling spirit. I don't care about a badge or having some little thing. I care about engaging a person. I'm convinced that when a revelation of the indwelling spirit touches you, I believe that loneliness will get broken off of you. I believe that rejection will get broken off of you. I believe that the orphan spirit will get broken off of you. I believe that fear the fear of belonging, the fear of acceptance, the fear of being enough, having enough, the fear of being able to, <clears throat> to, 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 to come up against life's uh, circumstances. When the revelation of the Holy Spirit and his indwelling on the inside, and not only that, but that you're in Jesus and Jesus is in you. Look at the phrase. I want to just go back up here. Look at verse uh, 30 uh, or 28. When he says, I will not leave you orphans. Look at this. I will come to you. And we're going to tease this out in John 15 and 16. Jesus is going to, and what I love is that he will talk about in this night, he will go in and out between talking about the father and the spirit and himself as individual persons. And then he will talk as they're the one, they're the same person. And he will go in and out by talking about, the Father's coming, but then I'm going to send you the Spirit, but I want you to know the Spirit's me because I'm going to come to you. 
What's Jesus saying? He goes, I'm going to come to you in a way you've not known me before. And I'm going to now come to you by the indwelling spirit. And the same way that you're talking with me in the flesh right now, you're going to now talk to me by the indwelling spirit living on the inside of you. <laughs> I think it was Kenneth Hagin. He, uh, he had had, uh, uh, he was, he had this encounter with Jesus. And he, he was in a house alone. He, he hears steps coming down the hallway. And Jesus walks into his room. And he has like a two-hour visitation with Jesus. And he sees him. He sits on his bed. He talks to him for two hours. He talked to him about the ministry of healing and the prophetic and all kinds of things. But right up towards the end, Jesus said, uh, Kenneth, I want you to know that I'm never going to relate. I'm, you're never going to see me like this ever again. And he says, and from now on, I'm going to relate with you by the indwelling spirit. And in the same confidence and faith you have talking face to face with me right now, I want you to have the same confidence and faith talking to me by the still small voice, the small whispers, the nudges on your thought life and your emotions and those moments to where you begin to know things, I want you to understand that you're talking to me in the same way. It was Kenneth Hagin, one of the uh, Papa, Papa Hagin, one of the leaders in the faith movement. The main point is this. Do you talk to the Holy Spirit? 